recording. Welcome back, everyone, uh, for the second uh, session of the day. I will give the word to our chair, uh, Letizia, that kindly agreed to welcome us here. Please, Letizia. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, yeah, so um, I remind you it's a half an hour talk uh, with uh, 10 minutes uh, questions. So since the talk is short, uh, if uh, you want to ask a question, please write it in the chat. And then, okay, if it's very urgent, uh, we can stop uh, Subir. Otherwise, we, we go ahead and we leave the questions for the end. So please, Subir. Okay, thank you, uh, Leticia, Marco. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be at this conference. Uh, a lot of interesting talks on many related topics that I'm learning a lot from. Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, begin with just a into broad introduction to SYK models and its connection to the time pre-prem in soft mode. Hopefully I can be reasonably rapid here because I suspect many of you are familiar with these topics, but. It's useful to just get another perspective on it. Uh, and, and then the object of, uh, of our work recently has been to uh, take these insights on the SYK model and apply it to something more realistic, uh, like a TJ model. Um, and so I'll talk about some of that work and also that will also connect to uh, some of the work that uh, Olivia will present in the next talk. Okay, so let me just begin with a, first a very familiar model of fermions hopping on a random matrix Tij um, at some density Q. Um, so the random matrix we know has a semicircular density of states. Uh, and this really represents single particle states with a level spacing uh, of uh, one over N, where N is the size of the matrix. Uh, so one important quantity is the density of states at the Fermi level. So all of the states here are occupied at some fixed density. Uh, and as we know that this gives you an entropy, uh, which is given by the uh, Summerfield expansion, uh, where this gamma coefficient, uh, the entropy is extensive, but vanishes at zero temperature, uh, and the gamma coefficient is related to the density of states. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, uh, solid state physics 101. Uh, but now let me take this random matrix model and present it in a somewhat unfamiliar way. Uh, where we think of it on a many body system. So in the many body system, uh, the energy levels are the sum of the, all the occupied states. Uh, and there's two to the n states, not n states. Uh, and we can ask about the density of these two to the n states. So here's a plot uh, for just one sample uh, of all two to the n states. Uh, this is the density of states in these two, and these are the actual level. This is zooming into the bottom of the band. So there's a some, couple of interesting features uh, of this many body density of states. Uh, first of all, not too close to the bottom, if you look at it in a regime where the energy is extensive, uh, then this density of states is just the exponential of the entropy. Uh, this is the entropy in the microcanonical ensemble. Uh, since you know the entropy in the canonical ensemble, you can easily figure out what it is in the microcanonical ensemble, and this is what you get. Uh, it's square root of two and gamma E, uh, where gamma is the same number here. Uh, and uh, since E is extensive, uh, this is also about E to the N. So it's exponentially large, uh, the density of states uh, when the energy is extensive, which is no surprise. Uh, but I also want you to focus on the very, the tails that you see over here. Uh, and in the tails, you have a much larger spacing of energy levels. Uh, that's because these energy levels are just single particle excitations near the Fermi level, where you just add and occupy energies near this point, and these have a spacing of order one over n. Uh, so right near the bottom, you get these tails, uh, where the density of states, uh, in fact, uh, is n, not e to the n, but n. Okay, so now I'm going to focus on the same characteristics, but of the more Interesting model, the SYK model. Uh, here I'm considering the complex fermion version uh, where there is again some density of fermions uh, on, a, on a cluster of n sites, uh, but they only, in, they, they only determine the Hamiltonian is the two body interaction, uh, which is uh, completely a random number. 
So if you take just one sample uh, of the SYK model and do the exact same plot uh, of the density of many body states, uh, this is what you get. Uh, and this is the structure of the bottom of the band. So now if you look again in the regime where the energy is extensive uh, above the ground state, uh, then again, you would expect this to be E of S of E. Uh, and this turns out to be now rather different. Uh, first of all, if you look at the entropy in the canonical ensemble, uh, it has a linear uh, coefficient with a coefficient gamma, which now has of course no relation to any single particle density of states, but it happens to be linear. But the other important factor is that there's an uh, S naught, which is extensive and universal. Uh, and, and so therefore uh, the end density of state is still E to the N, but there's, a, there's this constant coming out front. Now that constant has a much stronger effect right near the bottom of the band. Uh, and here uh, you find that the density of states, when the energy of order one over N even, uh, the density of states uh, is exponentially large, e to the n. Uh, and the energy level spacing you know, remains of order e to the minus n, uh, essentially all the way up to the, to the ground state. Uh, and uh, so, so this, this is a remarkable feature, this exponentially large density of states near the bottom of the band. Uh, and the square root of e factor uh, which is the very bottom of this tail, that comes from the time parameterization mode, as I'll say a little bit more about. Um, the, so the one consequence uh, of this very large number of levels is that this is not a quasi-particle system. You cannot think of these levels uh, as occupying in uh, a few quasi-particle states because there just aren't enough quasi-particle states. The number of quasi-particle states will be n, uh, not e to the n. Uh, also, what's known today is that, in fact, you can interpolate between this and this uh, limits. Uh, and this is the famous cinch function. Uh, and I'll see that comes directly from the time parameterization mode, as I'll show you in, in a few minutes. Uh, so the entropy, so the density of states, you know, basically reduced to these two limits. And uh, when, you, when the energy is extensive to where the energy is about a one over n. Uh, and in the canonical ensemble, this amounts to a logarithmic correction, uh, which is about a one. Uh, there's no, N, these two terms are about an N. Uh, but this negative correction only becomes important when temperature is about an E to the minus N, where this can potentially become negative, but that's exactly the regime where uh, you have to worry about the discreteness of the levels. Okay. Uh, so in fact, this whole behavior here and this law correction is intimately connected, as I said, to the time parameterization mode and also to quantum gravity. So let me just give a, a quick discussion of that connection. Uh, sorry, this is just uh, contrasting from the single particle states uh, where you had uh, the random matrix model where you had these long tails uh, and a very sparse density of states. Whereas if you look at the SYK model, there is no tail at all. It's exponentially large all the way down to the ground state essentially. Uh, okay, so then I was going to say just a few words about the connection to black holes. And uh, um, so when you have, you know, if you have a theory of quantum gravity, the first guess would be to just take your theory of favorite theory of quantum gravity and evaluate this path integral. Uh, and that will tell you something about quantum gravity. Now that's, of course, impossible because uh, this theory is not really well defined. The path integral isn't well defined. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Gibbons and Hawking said, well, uh, let's not worry so much about all the corrections. Uh, let's just look at the saddle point. Uh, and in the saddle point, uh, they, took, they took the theory in Euclidean time, where, where h bar appears essentially as the length of the Euclidean pan circle. So if you just evaluate the saddle point with appropriate boundary conditions uh, for a black hole solution of Einstein gravity, uh, you'll get uh, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, which is proportional to the area uh, of the horizon. Uh, and this, of course, gives you uh, the interpretation of the, uh, this entropy as an entanglement entropy across the horizon. Uh, but they were pretty much silent about, about these corrections. Now, as Jan de Boer emphasized yesterday, even though we don't know about anything about the UV structure of gravity in principle, uh, this answer seems to be very robust. Uh, because it's some kind of coarse grain answer 
uh, of uh, uh, coarse grain measure of the, of the density of states. Uh, now it turns out we now know that in certain cases you can there's a subleading term which is also universal, uh, and that's the case for charged black holes. Uh, so if you take a theory of a black hole with a certain charge, uh, and then at fixed charge you send the temperature to zero. Uh, then it turns out that a three plus one dimensional black hole maps onto a theory of quantum gravity in one plus one dimension uh, at low energies. Um, and this theory of quantum gravity is what I will describe in a few minutes, at least the slow energy limit, uh, is also the same gravity that you, the theory that you get to, to compute uh, the free energy from, from computing the free energy, the SYK model. So in fact, you can take the same calculation I showed you to, to obtain uh, the density of states at the bottom of the band of the SYK model uh, and figure out the correction to the entropy of a black hole because the low energy theory of both is described by the same uh, 2D quantum gravity theory. Uh, so in particular, if you take this type of charged black hole as t goes to zero, uh, th that has a Bekenstein Hawking entropy, uh, which just by from the saddle point of uh, the Einstein-Maxwell theory uh, is, has a term that's proportional to the area and in fact has a correction that goes linear in temperature. Uh, and then the path integral gives you a correction, the fluctuations about the saddle point uh, gives you a universal correction, which is independent of the full UV structure. Uh, and this is again, this precisely this minus three half log T. So if you see that the, the, the first two terms in fact, um, in the low temperature expansion of the Bekenstein of the entropy of a charged black hole uh, are universal and independent of the UV structure. And they are in fact identical. Oh, sorry, that should, uh, I didn't put that uh, to this term I had here for the SYK model. So there's a term constant plus a term linear in T both proportional to the air N here and the area of the horizon of black hole. Uh, and then there's a minus three halves log T correction uh, which is exactly what you get uh, uh, over here. Okay. Um, right, and so so this portion of the SYK model, these states uh, and the density of states that you get here um, is believed to be a very universal structure uh, for any theories that have this low energy theory, which is effectively a two-dimensional theory of quantum gravity. Okay. So, so now let me give you a, a, just a, a, a quick uh, summary of exactly how the connection is established between the SYK model and the time frame in soft mode. Uh, this was a calculation that was first outlined by Kitev and also by Maldasena and Stanford. Uh, so the basic idea, you start with the SYK model and you average over the disorder and you get this replicated path integral. Uh, then you insert the identity one uh, in this uh, path integral, which just tells you uh, that G is the Green's function. Uh, and when you integrate over sigma, uh, that just puts a delta function when G is equal to this. And then you integrate over G again, then you just get one. Now, if you insert this in here, after some manipulation, you can get rid of the fermions. Uh, and so you end up with a theory with instead of being in an integral over N fermionic fields, uh, is just an integral over two fields, uh, G and sigma, uh, but which are functions of two times, tau one and tau two. Uh, and then the exp and the action is some functional of G and sigma, sometimes called the G sigma theory. Uh, and so this is formally an exact representation of the path integral, uh, except that it leaves out all the replica of diagonal terms. Uh, which are not important anyway in the large end limit uh, because the system self averages. All right, so now this particular G sigma theory is secretly a, has a low energy theory that's a theory of gravity. Uh, and the reason is the following, that if you take at the saddle point of this action, uh, it turns out that these time derivative terms are not important. Uh, and because of that, the remaining uh, terms turn out to have a time view parameterization symmetry. You can uh, you can change from a time tau to a time sigma with an arbitrary monotonic time dependence, uh, and the action will not change. 
There's also an emergent gauge symmetry, little g, which uh, I will not mention for lack of time. Okay. Now, however, this time loop transition symmetry is not exact because this term is not exactly zero. So when you look at the, the fluctuations about the, some saddle point, uh, there is a nearly flat direction that where you would reparameterization time. Uh, and so what you want to do is do this path integral along that nearly flat direction. And that linear flat direction uh, is essentially the reparameterization, the time of the saddle point solution G sub S. So effectively you can then change variables and just go so just as you do in a nonlinear sigma model, you just go along the nearly flat direction uh, and you change from this large path integral to just an integral over uh, the time reparameterization and also a certain phase fluctuation. Uh, and there's a certain action that you then have to figure out through a variety of different methods, including numerical analysis and symmetries. Uh, and the action turns out to be this particular theory uh, which has an action for a phase fluctuation, which is a rotor, and then an action for time reprimization, which is the Schwarzschild theory. Uh, so this theory is in fact uh, completely stable and well-defined. In fact, you can compute the path integral exactly. Uh, and it's from those computations then uh, that you get uh, the results that I showed you earlier, the path integral over an action of this type. Uh, and the same action can also be obtained starting from, not from the SYK model, but starting from Einstein's theory of gravity uh, for a charged black hole. And then you dimensionally reduce near the horizon to 2D gravity, to so-called JT gravity. And eventually that uh, after certain gauge fixings is equivalent to, to this theory. Okay, so, so that's a very quick survey of how this is all done. So once you've got this theory, you can do the path integral and this is how you get the famous uh, density of states. Uh, I guess it was first obtained by Alex Otlund and, uh, and others uh, through essentially this method. Uh, but you can also compute some other things which uh, were useful for my rest of my talk. Uh, the Green's function, which uh, at the saddle point has a one over square root of tau dependence, has a correction. Uh, and that correction uh, turns out to have exactly one power of tau. Uh, and this alpha G is uh, you related to the number gamma and the gamma number uh, is in fact the coefficient of the Schwarzschild in this case. Uh, and that's the linear term of the specific heat. Uh, so once you have uh, this Green's function, you can look at corrections to various interesting quantities and particularly the fermions carry spin. There's a spin susceptibility, which is just the product of two Green's functions. Uh, and so this is something we did uh, uh, recently looked at the whole structure of subleading corrections to the cycle point theory due to the presence of various irrelevant operators. Uh, the most important correction is due to this time reparameterization term. And in frequency space for the spin susceptibility, uh, there's a leading sine omega term that comes from the leading one over square root of tau uh, SYK Green's function. And this is the time reparameterization correction. And this is a comparison from this kind of expansion to numerical solution of the full SYK equations. Uh, and so you see this linear term here, uh, which is observed in the numerical solution too. Uh, you can also do this at finite temperature and then you get this Planckian time behavior where the characteristic frequency scale is just temperature and independent of U. Uh, and there's some universal corrections uh, uh, particularly this correction here is again a consequence of this time reprogrammization mode. All right, so, so that's then uh, uh, hopefully a useful summary of basic properties of the SYK model and how they're obtained from a, essentially a theory of uh, quantum gravity. Okay, so it's very tempting to apply that to, to some real physical system. And the kind of system, of course, that I'm interested in uh, is say the cuprates. Uh, and there are regimes in the cuprates like the so-called Planckian metal regime where there's some superficial similarity to what you see in the SYK model. If you look at you know, relaxation times and certain, in certain regimes, an analog of resistivity uh, and so on, it looks superficial, superficially similar. But if you look more broadly, uh, the SYK model just doesn't seem right because what we know in uh, 
these observations and also in other materials, the Planckian metal, you know, doesn't appear on its own. It appears in between a regular Fermi liquid uh, and what's called a pseudogap metal. And the pseudogap metal is really a, a signature that eventually at a certain density, uh, the system is going to become an insulator where the charge is going to be completely localized uh, and or a mod insulator. And, and this mod insulator is completely absent from the SYK model. That they don't, no matter how, what, how large you is, and no matter what the density, you don't get a mod insulator. And reason of course, is that it has no local repulsion between the electrons. So if you're going to apply the SYK model to any correlated electron system, it's essential we put back this mod physics. And that's what the remaining part of my talk is going to be. Uh, and uh, fortunately, and we're going to argue from our re recent work, uh, there's still quite remarkably some of the SYK physics survives when you take a more realistic model with the smart physics. Uh, one other feature of the mod physics that will be important for this is that in the pseudo gap regime, uh, there's evidence in, at least in the wide class of materials, not all, uh, of spin glass order where the spins freeze uh, uh, in, this had been seen earlier, but in this recent measurements by Marc Henri Julien's group, uh, the spin glass order extends all the way up to this critical doping P star, which is where you get Planckian metal type behavior, which has superficial similarities to SYK. Okay, so, so the type of model we'd like, love to solve is this, what's called the TJ model. Uh, and the crucial feature of the TJ model is that the Hilbert space uh, is highly constrained. So on each site of the TJ model, there are only three states, uh, the empty state, spin up, spin down, but the state with uh, two electrons uh, is prohibited. Uh, in the TJ model, it has infinite energy. Uh, and it's that prohibition of double occupancy, which makes this a highly non-trivial model and which is entirely missing from the SYK physics. Okay, so you want to put in this uh, three state constraint or this constraint that the number of electrons on any site uh, is always less than one. And then on this little bit space, you have uh, some hopping matrix elements Tij and uh, a four fermion term and exchange interaction Jij. Okay, now, you know, enormous effort has been spent trying to solve this problem on the square lattice, which is what you find in the cuprates. Uh, but here we take a more limited aim. We say, okay, uh, let's, let's just make these Tij and Jij random numbers uh, and, uh, and try to solve it. Now, what you see now, if you just ignore this constraint, this is like a, a random matrix model, like the first part of my talk. And this is sort of like the SYK model in the, in the next part of my talk. Uh, and when both terms are present on their own, this term is always more important. And so at low enough temperatures, this, the, you would say that this would just become a Fermi liquid, a uh, quasi-particle system. However, that argument ignores the fact that there's a constraint. So we have to put the constraint back in. Uh, and as we'll see, once you put the constraint back in, that actually gives you an avenue to resurrecting this interesting SYK physics. Uh, so here's kind of a picture. You have a random site. You can hop from any site to any site, and you have uh, pairwise exchange between any pair of sites. Okay, so one very useful way to think about this uh, is in terms of a, uh, of a super spin. So we have three states on each side, and I'll think of those three states, uh, the states of a super spin. Uh, and there's the empty states, which I'll got called, uh, I'll label by adding a boson, B sometimes called a hole on to some vacuum. Uh, and then the spin off, uh, spin up and spin down states, I added a fermion, uh, which I'll call F, the spin on. So the, this operator C uh, essentially takes you from one state to this state to that, it'll annihilate this and take you to that. And you can see what that corresponds to is creating a B and, uh, and annihilating an F, whereas S is the usual spin rotation operator. So you see the C operator is a rotation, but now it's a rotation in this Fermi-Bose space or the superspin space. 
uh, the constraint, of course, this is what makes this theory much more non-trivial. It has a local constraint, uh, and uh, which effectively constrains the length of the spin. And this is a SU one slash two super spin because uh, uh, it has uh, one bosonic and two fermionic components. Okay, this is just a rewriting of the Hilbert space uh, uh, of this model. Now, however, there's another choice you can make. Uh, you can make the empty states of fermion and these two spins boson. This would be SU2 slash one super spin space. And this, these are completely equivalent. And in fact, exactly the same because these two groups are exactly the same. Uh, but in this language, now you can see how you could at least start to get uh, the, at least the two basic phases of the TJ model. So as large doping, uh, you know, we know from experiments and we expect that uh, you have a disordered Fermi liquid. Uh, and, and the characteristic of a disordered Fermi liquid is you have the one over tau decay of, from, the Fermi sub, from the Fermi energy excitations uh, of the electron propagator. And you have one over tau squared decay of the spin fluctuations, which is basically the square of, of this. On the other hand, in a metallic spin glass, it's still a metal because so they have the same one over tau decay of the fermion, uh, whereas the spin correlations go to a constant. The spins freeze uh, and have infinite memory um, of, uh, of the random exchange terms that you have. So how do you get these phases in this random TJ model in this fractionalized uh, language? So for the disordered Fermi liquid, uh, you know, appears at high doping, there's more charges. So what you expect is that the, the, the or there are more holes. So you expect the whole states to have lower in energy. So what you do here is just make the, uh, the holes a boson, the whole on the boson, and you condense it. So when you condense it, basically uh, the electron becomes a Fermi operator carrying spin uh, and uh, it essentially becomes a, uh, you know, uh, the random hopping uh, applies to the electrons uh, and you just get a Fermi liquid. Uh, so that's one way, and this is the SU1 slash two theory. However, to get the metallic spin glass, uh, you have to do the other thing. You have to make the holons, which are now higher in energy, a fermion, uh, and you condense uh, the spin-ons, which are now bosons. And once you condense the spin-ons, you immediately get uh, a long time spin correlation, which is in a spin glass. Uh, so this is a, the different theory. Uh, and this is, the, this is the, the term where the J term dominates uh, and you get a spin glass and then the remaining holes just move around and there's a small density of them. So these are qualitatively very similar characteristics that you find uh, in, in, the, <coughs> in the two phases in the experiments anyway. Uh, and so then the question becomes, uh, what about the phase transition between them? Well, we're going to present the next talk, we'll present a lot of numerical study of this model with evidence of exactly these two phases and a phase transition which exhibits SYK criticality. What I want to do in my remaining time <coughs> uh, is to show you how you get this SYK physics in this fractionalized language. And so to get this, you actually have to take another sort of a double scaling limit. We've already sent n to infinity. And then you take your SU2 group and send m to infinity. And in that limit, you can actually understand, we believe the basic results that appear from a direct solution numerically of the SU2 model. In particular, when you take this particular limit and exactly how you take it, uh, decides whether you use this representation or that representation. So let me use this one. Uh, so if you, the way you do that uh, is you, first of all, rewrite your, uh, your electron and spin operator in terms of these fractionalized particles. And now you notice that the original Hamiltonian becomes a four body term both in both cases. So here this has F, F, B, B. Uh, between the spin-ons and the holons, and these are all the spin-ons here. And so now you can see, instead of having a two-body term, which fully dominates uh, in, if these were, if you didn't have the local constraint, they're both four-body terms and they can balance each other. And it turns out to be an intermediate regime where you get essentially an SYK solution. Uh, 
So you get an SYK type solution, but of these emergent fractionalized particles. So that's the basic neophysics essentially. Uh, and from that, you can then compute physical correlation functions and you find things that are in you know, excellent agreement with the numerics that I'll show a little bit about uh, and Olivia will say more. Uh, and you can also get the space, the structure of this basic uh, phase diagram. Okay, so one of the things we can compute to get the punchline of my talk uh, is transport properties. Uh, so the leading Green's function like in any SYK solution is one over square root of tau. Uh, and this one, if you square this one over square root of tau, uh, that's how you get this uh, one over tau decay of the spin correlation and also the one over tau decay of the, uh, the electron Green's function. Uh, and from that, you can then compute resistivity in a kind of a very similar large dimensional model where the resistivity is clearly defined. And you just get a constant, some residual resistivity. Uh, however, we want to look at the leading temperature dependence. So you have to look at the leading correction to, uh, to this Green's function in SYK, and that's this one over tau behavior that I told you about earlier coming from the primary parameterization mode. So if you carry this correction through to the resistivity, uh, you get exactly one power of T with a coefficient of a G, which depends, in, which is in fact related to the gamma coefficient of the specific heat and the coefficient of the Schwarzschild. Uh, so in this double scaling limit of n and m going to infinity, in fact, there is in fact a linear temperature dependence down to zero temperature uh, with a coefficient which is just given by the time of parameterization mode. Uh, and really, you know, this is, as far as I know, the first model where you can reliably get that something that's linear in temperature down to zero temperature. Uh, and it, it's essentially a consequence of this time of parameterization mode. Uh, all right, so we're going to hear a lot more about uh, numerical studies of such models, TJ models and extended Hubbard models by Olivia in the next talk. Um, I just quickly show you something I don't think it's going to show you. This is exact diagnostic study of the SU2 model. Uh, and as a function of doping, what you see is that at low doping, you see spin glass order because this is a spin susceptibility. It gives you a kind of a delta function peak at small frequency. Uh, but as you increase the doping, uh, you see that the near critical doping, you get this behavior, which is very similar uh, to what we obtained in the SYK model with this linear and omega term, again, coming from this boundary graviton, the time of parameterization mode. Uh, so this is, I hasten to add, this is the actual TJ model with random couplings for SU2. So there's no other, uh, so that seems to have at least some tentatizing signal uh, of this physics of the boundary graviton. Okay, so that, that's the end of my talk. Uh, so let me just summarize the main thing. Uh, so one of the reasons I like the SIK model uh, is that it's one of the unique solvable models without quasi-particle excitations, which exhibits rapid thermalization and many body chaos in the shortest possible time, this Planckian time, which is independent of microscopic energy scales. Uh, the low energy theory of this model is a theory of time parameterization, which can also be interpreted as a boundary graviton in a 2D quantum gravity theory on ADS2. Um, but the model, we, as a kinetic matter physicist, that we're interested in the random TJ model. Uh, so, first, there's the important step of going from the square lattice TJ model to the random TJ model. Some people might question that. In fact, I'm repeatedly questioned on that. Well, so I'll, well, here I'll, uh, to that point, I will say that, you know, at least it seems like you capture much of the basic physics that you observe in the experiments. You get to the pseudo gap phase, a small uh, doping, you get a Fermi liquid or large doping, and you get a Planckian metal behavior near the transition between these two, all in complete agreement uh, with the ob observations. Of course, there are many details of what happened in the pseudo gap at very low temperatures, which the random TJ model will not capture. But it, you know, at zeroth order, it gets the, the, the big picture right. Uh, and also this Planckian metal behavior is connected, as I've just argued, to SYK criticality. Uh, and in the SYK criticality, the, this talk anyway, the hero of the talk is the boundary graviton because it leads to this linear and omega correction to the dynamic spin susceptibility. 
also the famous linear resistivity in the random PJ model, uh, and the universal correction to the Beckenstein arcing entropy of charged black holes in Einstein gravity. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Sylvia. So, are there any questions in the audience? Um, there is a question in the chat. I don't know if you. Yeah, you, I can. In the cube break, first... Selenia. Uh, so in the Q phrase, the T linear resistivity persists over a large range of temperature. Is there any argument why the corrections to the T linear term you showed should be suppressed over a uh, similarly large range of temperatures? Uh, okay, yeah, so that's an excellent question. I mean, there are many different observations. I'm not sure, that, yeah, also some in the Q phrase. But there's a regime where the resistivity is smaller than H over E squared. Uh, and then there's a regime where the resistivity is bigger than H over E squared. and Roughly, it seems to have the same slope. Uh, so my discussion here, if it applies at all to the cube rates, is about the low temperature part, uh, where getting a linear T resistance has been very, very difficult. And this is one of the first models to show it. Uh, and, and as to why the slope shouldn't change as you go to much higher temperatures where the physics is going to change from what I've discussed, uh, I'd say that's largely an open question. Uh, there's actually some uh, nice papers by uh, Avishkar Patel and Una Kim on this question. And I know there's, they, uh, there's going to be further papers on them. Uh, so that's an interesting question that they've been addressing, but uh, something that I, I, I think is uh, still, still open. Yeah. So Elias Kiritsis, you want to ask your question? I see your hand raised. Uh, yes. Um, uh, hi, Shubir. I'd like to uh, understand um, the linear and T resistivity. At some point, it will change in the ultraviolet. At what scale is this happening, and what controls it? Well, so uh, so in this theory, which is what I can answer, I think I just answered it more generally for the real world. So in this particular theory, uh, you know, this is just, you know, this as you know, this for example, this uh, is this an expansion. Uh, in T over J or one over beta J. Uh, and so, the, so what you're including here is that the, is the leading irrelevant operator, which is the, uh, which is the Schwarzschild mode. And that's the same term over here. So it's an expansion in T over J and there will be in general corrections with higher powers of T over J. So, you know, this is a, uh, yeah. Uh, I would say that, you know, there are certain artifacts here which come from the fact we're also taking the large M limit. Uh, one of the artifacts is that, you know, this is really in the end a correction to the leading term. Uh, if you look at the numerics, which, uh, I, uh, which uh, Olivier will present in the next talk, it doesn't look like a correction. It's in fact as large as the leading term. And why that's the case, uh, we don't understand. Uh, that's the, even for the random PJ model, I think that's, uh, that's a bit of an open question. Uh, I see, but from the random DJ model, uh, if you do a calculation Sorry. in the ultraviolet, can you tell what the asymptotic form of the resistivity would be? Uh, well, we haven't done that, Masara. I realized okay. I wasn't sharing. I wasn't sharing the screen when I was pointing to the screen. So <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I was I was just answering a previous question. Sorry, let me just take a quick. Yeah, so I was I was pointing to the screen, but I realized I wasn't sharing it. Uh, right. So what I was just said uh, is that this term t over j is a correction from the leading irrelevant operator, uh, and uh, there are other corrections with other operators, which will all be suppressed by powers of t over j, and we don't understand why the one term here and this term here. Uh, are in fact how, why this kind of result should hold as it does in numerics, even when this term is not smaller than that. Uh, so that's an open question. So to your question, you, you want to take the ultraviolet, the very high temperature limit. Yeah. Uh, so you have to do a one over temperature expansion. I, I think that has been done by various people. So what happens there is it's the compressibility that uh, has a one over temperature dependence, not uh, 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 not the diffusivity, uh, and you end up getting linear and T behavior in the UV too. But the important, you know, the complicated question is uh, why they have roughly the same slope. I don't think 
that's a question, as I said, that's been addressed by Avesh Karpatil and Una Kim and others. And I think there's gonna be more papers in that question. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Are there other questions in the audience? Or in the chat? <laughs> 